Hello, everybody. This is George Ann Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And we have with us tonight Joseph P. Farrell. You can email Joseph at vardes3 at aol.com. His website is giza, G-I-Z-A, deathstar.com. And last week we did Cosmic War Part 1. And this is uh, sort of the theme of tonight, this Cosmic War, because there certainly is one going on. (laughs) Anyway, um, Joseph is an author, a very brilliant author, highly gifted researcher. He holds a doctorate from the University of Oxford and has published four previous works on theology. He recently moved back to his home state of South Dakota, where he pursues research on his other loves and hobbies, including classical music, he is an organist, and he plays the harpsichord, and composes classical music. He writes on alternative history and science and what we might call real strange stuff, but boy, is it exciting and thought-provoking. Hi there, Joseph. Hi, George Ann. How are you tonight? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a, a day. Well, your new book, I received that late, late, late today in the mail. And I'm just dying to get into it. It's a, it's a very heavy book, boy. <laughs> yes. In, in, in a lot of ways. In a lot of ways. But uh, I would, I, I certainly, if people that are interested in uh, uh, the planet and what goes on around the planet, outside of the planet, uh, all kinds of places, they need this book. <laughs> they really do. Uh, Technology, oh my gosh, it's just brilliant with technology. And um, with this cosmic war, Mm -hmm. in the last segment that we did, Joseph, Mm -hmm. um, we touched on the fact that um, this war has been going on for a long time on a lot of different levels. And I had mentioned that I believe that before the flood that there were uh, people uh, in sufficient numbers that had technology uh, in advance of what we have today. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you bring that forward? to what is going on now because we we got into the Nazis in their search for technology and genetic material um, it, you know it's 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 a real mystery well to bring it forward uh, we have to go back a bit and, and kind of outline what I believe uh, the nature of the technology was that was possessed how it was used yeah and then uh, to view certain political events today in the speculative context of, of that technology. Right. Uh, the, the new book is called The Cosmic War, and then the subtitle is Interplanetary Warfare, Modern Physics and Ancient Texts. And in that book, I extend my what I call paleophysics analysis. That's just a term I coined. For the, it comes from two Greek words, of course, paleo meaning ancient. And uh, so, in other words, paleophysics would mean ancient physics. So it's but, my, but that's a great word, by the way. Thank you. It's, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have any other way to describe really what I, I love was trying it. to say. I think it's just say. great, brilliant. But um, essentially, the, my method in, in pursuing this paleophysics is to take certain passages that appear in ancient texts, particularly Egyptian, uh, Hurrian, Sumerian, and so on, 
those are the principal texts that I examine, family of texts that I examine in the Cosmic War. And to take those texts and to examine certain statements in them from the standpoint that they may encode or embody descriptions as best as people back then could could come up with descriptions of a very sophisticated physics. And then to compare those passages with certain notions in, in contemporary physics theory. And when you do that, what emerges are very clear, albeit generalized, descriptions of a very sophisticated technology that was in the possession of, of, for want of a better word, an antediluvian civilization that uh, I believe was based on this planet, but elsewhere in the solar system, possibly even the galaxy. And, And my reasons for stating those things are, again, outlined in that book. But if we take the existence of this technology that was weaponized, we also are confronted with another fact in these ancient texts, and this is very, very clear, particularly in the Sumerian, the Egyptian, and and Hurrian traditions, although I would mention that uh, in the Vedic tradition as well, one finds uh, numerous, numerous texts of descriptions of the wars of the gods, the technologies that they used. And you can also find similar descriptions in, in the Greek myths and so on and so forth. So we're not dealing here with necessarily a legend that's peculiar to that area of the world. It's certainly a universal phenomenon once you get into the study of some of these ancient legends. Mm. But the reason I concentrate on Egyptian, Hurrian, and and, uh, uh, Sumerian texts is because it is in those particular families of legends that you find the most sophisticated descriptions of this technology that would lend itself to the kind of analysis that I, I pursue. So I assume that this technology existed and that it was used, as the texts indicate, to fight these uh, horrendously destructive wars of the gods. And in doing so, I, I come to the conclusion in that book that the wars that they are describing are interplanetary in nature. Uh, one of the things that is a contemporary theory within astronomy is the exploded planet hypothesis. Right. That the asteroid belt, it's actually, it's actually an old hypothesis. It's been around since the very early eight, uh, 19th century. Um, but this hypothesis has been revised, and, and it's used to explain why the asteroid belt exists. Because asteroids, if you examine their geological evidence and so on and so forth, they give every indication of having been blown to bit parts of a once existing planet in that particular orbit of the solar system. Now, once we say that, we have to confront ourselves with with a nasty fact of physics, and that is that there is in modern physics no really good model to explain why a planet should suddenly and spontaneously explode of natural causes. The models just do not exist. Now, that's interesting because in the exploded planet hypothesis, it has great explanatory power. It can explain the existence of the asteroid belt, uh, the origin of comets, uh, even to a certain extent it dovetails quite nicely with certain geological evidence here on Earth. But... That explanatory power is vitiated by the fact that there is no model to explain why planets explode, except as the modern author that has revived this idea, his name is Dr. Tom Van Flandern. Uh, He was an astronomer for the U.S. Naval Observatory. So in other words, this this is not a fly-by-night scientist that we're talking about. But once we compare this hypothesis with these ancient texts, it is almost an inescapable reality based on the evidence of those texts that the wars that they are describing are interplanetary in nature and that this technology, this weaponized uh, physics, was powerful enough to explode a planet. So we're kind of we're kind of dealing with an ancient version of Star Wars, for want of a better uh, explanation, because mm-hmm. everyone is familiar with that movie, you know, the first movie, and, and then uh, the destruction of an entire planet by means of a weapon, mm-hmm. a super weapon. So that's kind of where that technology goes. In other words, 
to kind of outline the method that I'm pursuing here, I'm, I'm saying that a sophisticated civilization existed. It had a sophisticated physics because in the texts and in modern physics literature, we can see the outlines of a science, of a theory of physics, that if weaponized would be powerful enough to blow up a planet. And then we see evidence of an exploded planet here in our solar system. So marshalling all that together, we have to conclude that a civilization of that tremendous sophistication once existed here. Now, to pursue this forward, and that's kind of a long way around Harvey's barn to answer your question, but we're getting here now. But um, to pursue this forward, I happen to believe, and it's, again, pure speculation, but I do happen to believe that there may be an alternative, so to speak, esoteric agenda for the involvement of the United States in Great Britain in Iraq. And that is precisely because many of the ancient texts that I describe in Cosmic War, and I cite them copiously, um, many of these ancient texts and the technology that they describe would stem from that area of the world. So it may be that there is, in addition to oil and geopolitics, it may be that there is an esoteric reason for our presence there in that somebody somewhere wants to recover as much of that technology or at least descriptions of it or further our descriptions of it as possible. So that's one possibility, and I think that we have to kind of look at certain events in Iraq from that point of view, because prior to Great Britain and, and the United States going in there, France and Germany had teams of archaeologists working for the Hussein regime at his behest to excavate and recover certain areas in Iraq and to recover uh, cuneiform tablets and so on and so forth. When we went in there, those archaeological teams were pulled out by uh, the French and British or the French and, and German governments. And curiously, after our arrival in, in Baghdad, everyone will remember the, the curious Baghdad Museum looting incident, where several oh, yes. priceless uh, objects, very ancient things, were taken out of the museum, stolen, and allegedly recovered, some of them recovered and restored. Now, I find that suspicious because if you look on the Internet uh, into that incident, you'll discover that there are many people raising some questions about it because it had every appearance, in their words, of being an inside job. Now, I find it very interesting also because the Germans were the ones that kept the records of, of what had been discovered there. And there is uh, documented, again, uh, Internet stories about the German Bundesnachrichtendienst, which is kind of their version of the CIA, uh, having a, a rather heavy presence in Iraq, you know, which I find very peculiar because Germany hasn't made any military commitment to the area. So their presence there, uh, you know, gathering intelligence would not seem to be entirely for our benefit because, you know, we have our own intelligence resources available to us, so we certainly wouldn't need an on-the-ground German presence there. So I believe that they're probably looking for something else. So that kind of brings it forward. Um, I do believe that there are people that are consciously attempting to reconstruct this technology. And, oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes, definitely. So that, that kind of puts a spin on your question, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> I hope an accurate one. Well, yeah. And, um, you know, we mentioned last time also, I think there are, uh, uh, if we want to call them dimensional beings, demons, whatever, uh, that are very interested in um, getting... Um, their their workers, if you will, um, to get very, very uh, good at this technology so they can travel to places. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of dimensional stuff. 
uh, in vaults. They, I, you know, I'm wondering if flesh and blood, as we know it, um, could actually, for example, live on the moon or live on Mars without being in some kind of a very protected biosphere. Um, you know, they may want or need uh, bodies, if you will, of some type that are manufactured so they can inhabit them, so they can uh, have a, a physical presence. Well, it's, you know, that's, that's, that's speculation, and yeah. it, it goes beyond, really, the evidence of the text. But, that being said, yeah. uh, one of the things that is apparent in the text that I cite in, in The Cosmic War is that there is some sort of genetic agenda taking place. I don't go into it that much in the book, right. although I certainly imply it and suggest it. But if one looks at the Sumerian text in particular and how the so-called higher beings view mankind, mm -hmm. whom it is very clear from those texts, they basically engineer to be workers, to be slaves. So whatever whatever speculation I would have to, to give in response to that would have to be based on, on the text, and, and that's what they say. Mm. Um, now, it's interesting that one of the reasons that they these higher beings, gods, whatever you wish to call them, and I do believe that they, they were uh, physical beings, because I think that's also rather clear from the text, although... Uh, I don't rule out the possibility that they they may have some had some other form of of existence besides merely merely physical. But if we look at those texts, one of their reasons for wiping out mankind in a, just a variety of terribly gruesome ways that are that are described in detail in, in in the book is that mankind had simply grown far too fast in terms of the population. In other words, uh, mankind was perceived as being some sort of political threat. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. So, you know, the decision was taken to wipe out mankind, and, and then you have certain characters in, in the pantheon, the Sumerian pantheon, deciding that this is a really bad idea, and, and then warning mankind to, you know, prepare for the worst and, and uh, trying to save a remnant. So it, you know, it's 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 a it's a question I don't get into in the book that much, but I, I do indicate one very interesting thing. Since I'm concerned so much with physics, with a, a, a kind of a hyperdimensional physics in this particular book, I do mention the possibility that when one and and I know this from from doing it myself. When one is examining these uh, mathematical topologies, these languages that describe objects in four or more dimensions, mm -hmm. a very interesting thing begins to occur, and that is that your mind begins uh, to use the equations of, of topology as a way of picturing those things. So one does have a kind of... a, a, a an expansion of consciousness, so to speak, because the, the technique, the mathematical technique itself, allows you to do that. So it's a very interesting thing, and it's, it's very interesting that it's only been, say, within the last oh, 150 years or so, within mathematical physics, that we've had the, the, the techniques available to us to do that, if we so choose. Well... I think computers. <laughs> and that too. Yeah, that helps a lot. Sure. You know, um, you know, it's just so interesting, uh, the kinds of things, uh, <laughs> at the level that they're being carried out. Uh, right. Plasma. Right. Um, pl you know, biologists that deal with uh, uh, mycoplasmas. Um, uh, it's, peering into the most 
delicate, tiny uh, things, inserting um, things that are foreign to it and causing it to accept it. Mm -hmm. um, these things are going on. And um, it's <laughs> fascinating is not the right word. I mean, it's beyond that. It's uh, it's way beyond fascinating. Well, it's like we said last time with with the first part of the interview. Yeah. Some of this technology, particularly in, in uh, physics and geti genetics, is just getting downright scary. Yeah. Uh, and, and in genetics, particularly, and uh, you know, again, I don't go into this aspect of things very much in the books. But it is very clear that this civilization, and, and one reason I, I feel safe and confident in saying this, because I, I, I cite so many of these texts in the new book, is that this, this ancient civilization, in addition to possessing a sophisticated physics mm -hmm. that I believe was, was beyond our own, yes. it also possessed a very sophisticated genetic science, again, which I believe was, was beyond our own. We are, in terms of reconstructing this science, we are at the very beginning of it. We've developed the basic techniques and, and theoretical models, both in physics and, and in genetics, but we are a long way yet from accomplishing the kinds of things that those texts describe. That being said... Yeah. We are also able now to view those texts as something other than merely non-historical myths. They're certainly myths, to be sure, but they contain elements or, or grains of, of real truth in them that I think is going to be uh, an ever-expanding element of truth as our science advances, because more and more aspects of those texts are going to become unlocked. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you are absolutely right, Joseph. Well, back to the technology. Sure. Um, I don't think that it's what they, they term ET technology. Um, they may have invoked certain things in order to get it. Uh, Alistair Crowley and JPL, Jack Whiteside Parsons. Right. Uh, you know, there's a well-known story there. Sure. Um, you know, it, it's just very important to certain people that we probably quietly uh, go about our business in space uh, building this technology um, for the purposes of, of travel. And before we started recording, I mentioned to you, uh, in you know, the, at the flood, at the destruction, uh, there is some writings in the Pseudepigrapha that state that uh, these higher uh, entities, beings, whatever people want to call them, uh, left the planet and parked in the meridian of high noon and watched the destruction on the earth and wept. Well, now, how, but, but Joseph, how would somebody, uh, you know, three or four hundred years A.D., uh, think of that? Well, obviously, kind of. obviously they wouldn't. And, and there is another reference in the Sumerian tradition, mm -hmm. uh, the legend, the Sumerian legend of the flood. The hero's name is Apishtim. Yes. And he's, you know, the story records that he's actually taken above the earth and, and looks down on it mm -hmm. as all of this is taking place. So again, you know, uh, one of the things I point out in the new book is is that the Old Testament moves actually between Samaria and Egypt. So if you view certain things in the Old Testament from their cosmologies, interesting things begin to, to come out. And, and it doesn't surprise me. I'm, I'm not aware of the pseudepigraphal reference, but it doesn't surprise me that it's there because there's so much uh, parallelism. Uh, in the Old Testament, and, and particularly the Sumerian traditions, it, it's just uh, it's rather astonishing once you get into it. Oh, yeah. uh, speaking of the Sumerian 
uh, text. Uh, have you read Noah Kramer's work? No, I have not. Very interesting. Uh, for example, he talks about an evil wind that came and uh, animals dropped dead in their stalls, um, all kinds of things like that, that. That is actually a reference that occurs in the original Sumerian text, so I'm familiar with that. Okay. Uh, and, you know, Sitchin brings this reference out as well in his works, and, and he interprets it, of course, as, as radioactive fallout. And I'm not so sure, um, because I think, again, uh, we tend to, to read texts if we're looking for clues to ancient technology on the basis of, of the science that we know. And in Sitchin's case, you know, it's, it's rockets and nuclear weapons. And, and, you know, well, rockets are just, flatly put, just not a very efficient way of, of travel in an interplanetary civilization, even one based locally here in the solar system. Uh, chemical rockets are just just terribly slow. They're terribly inefficient. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not a technology that's all that advanced. It's, it's, you know, if one considers the Chinese have been playing with rockets for thousands of years, yeah. it's a very old one. Yeah. Uh, and nuclear bombs would certainly give off uh, fallout and things like that sure. and could be described as a nuclear wind. But nuclear bombs are simply insufficient to the task of blowing up an entire planet. Right. So I think that we have to go back if we're going to, if we're inclined to look at texts and see in them the residue of some sort of sophisticated paleophysics, that we have to go beyond uh, nuclear thinking and and start thinking in some very unconventional ways and and uh, hopefully base those ways of thinking on on some contemporary physics theory. Well, another question that sure. I had about physics, Maxwell. Mm-hmm. How come in the schools they don't uh, teach Maxwell's equations in their original form? Uh, yeah. Well, I think it's I think the simplest explanation is that quaternion geometry is a horrendously complex mathematical language. It's, it's a higher order topology. It'll allow you to do things that you simply cannot do with with linear algebra and, and tensor calculus and so on. Mm. But, you know, most uh, most physicists and mathematicians will tell you that tensor calculus itself is just <laughs> horrendously difficult, and it is. But, you know, when you make it even more so, uh, I, think, I think the short answer has to be it's just simpler to teach the edited versions of Maxwell's equations since those forms of the equations are more or less the basis of, of modern electromagnetic theory. And for all intents and purposes, it works. I mean, we have electric lights and computers and so on and so forth. But if we extend our analysis a bit and speculate, what Maxwell did was he essentially made possible a form of electromagnetism that was primarily an examination of stress in the medium, or in, if you will, in the fabric of space-time. I prefer the term medium because uh, the, the term space-time has relativistic connotations for most people that I don't think uh, are quite applicable here. Okay. But when we when we consider that this was his principal interest, then it is immediately apparent that one implication of that idea is that electromagnet magnetic energy is then capable of stressing that medium, and therefore the potential for weaponization is just absolutely horrendous. And we add to that fact that it would also make a technology theoretically possible that would more or less end the the dependency of humanity on on non uh, non uh, oh I, I can't think of the word right now non renewable sources of energy in other words fossil fuels 
So if there is a covert agenda at play with the continued uh, teaching of, of an edited version of his equations, I would say it would have to be those two things that are behind it. Uh, there's an altruistic agenda to keep uh, just vastly horrendous powerful weapons out of the wrong hands, and then there would be a less altruistic agenda of, of keeping people more or less dependent on, on the current energy and socioeconomic order. Oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. And um, with what they, you know, with, okay, what you just said brings up the space program. Right. Again. Uh, that there is more than one space program, if you will. Right. One is for the public, and one is uh, not uh, in view, as it were. Right. I think it is what people are seeing when they see these gigantic triangles uh, that they, you know, all kinds of strange craft flying mm -hmm. around. Uh, yeah, there have been throughout history uh, sightings. You know, it, there's a lot of ancient texts that talk about uh, craft. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that this stuff belongs to a segment of... I, I hesitate to call them people, Joseph. I mean, they're not like you and me, <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know what I'd call them. I don't think they're ETs. I think they're here. They've always been here. And uh, well, I don't. I, I don't get into speculation too much in, in my various books, where I do consider this this two space programs hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, I don't get into too much speculation about alternatives or other life forms. I imply it to be sure. As, as one possibility. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the actual uh, hard evidence for the existence of two space programs, uh, I, I go back to my two books on Nazi secret weapons, Reich of the Black Sun and, and SS Brotherhood of the Bell. And particularly in the second book, I, I devote a whole chapter to the idea of, of what I call the two space programs hypothesis. Now, that hypothesis has been around at least as early as the late 1960s, early 1970s, with mm -hmm. the appearance of a document on the Kennedy assassination called the Torbett document, which strongly suggests that this was one motivation behind his assassination. And hello. Yes. Uh oh. Yes. And one of the uh, one of the things that I consider in there in that book is that. If we look at early Soviet and American lunar probes and the schedule of launches for them, it's very strange because for several years, the Soviet Union and the United States would sort of trade off. The Soviet Union would send a series of probes to the moon, then the United States would do it, and then back to the Soviet Union, and then the United States again. It's almost as if somebody somewhere is centrally coordinating the launch schedules and, and mission uh, plans and priorities for these things. And the only group with a presence in both countries that would have been capable of that sort of coordination would have been this leftover Nazi network of, of intelligence agents and scientists inside of both countries. Right. So I, I consider things from that perspective, and I think it's kind of interesting. Um, Richard Hoagland, uh, who's, of course, probably very well known to most of your listeners, Richard Hoagland has been suggesting a similar things and, and documenting it with uh, some consistency over the years. And uh, he, I think, has, has come to the conclusion uh, that there must be, there have to be, two space programs with, with a covert agenda and perhaps, uh, I may be putting words into his mouth here, perhaps an alternative technology that's made the covert one possible. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's just published a new book, incidentally, and, and uh, I think he gets into this, judging from what I've seen on the 
internet about the book, uh, he gets into this two space programs hypothesis rather extensively. So uh, I'm not the only one out there saying this. Um, I, I'm saying something peculiar about it in that I'm connecting the possibility historically to this this more or less independent rogue group of Nazis uh, inside uh, the, the space programs and intelligence services of, of both superpowers. So it's not a new idea. There is one aspect of Hoagland's work I think that, that your listeners would find very interesting, and that is that he has maintained for many years now that the launch schedules, the mission patches and logos and so on, uh, and the landing schedules of various probes and so on that, that NASA has launched are oddly coordinated, uh, statistically impossible for this to be a coincidence, with certain astrological alignments. Oh, yeah. and, and he credits this to, to the heavy presence of, of Masons within the space program. Oh, well, that's all occultish. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's a very complex subject. And, you know, I, I think just on the basis of some of the things that I've heard him say and, and some of the papers that he's uh, put up on his website and then some of the things that I've uncovered that I talk about in SS Brotherhood of the Bell, I think that if we're looking for a historical basis for this idea and then the idea of a covert technology and mm -hmm. then an occult agenda that is manipulating it, then we would definitely have to go back to Nazi Germany because all of this mentality is very much a part of their party ideology. Yes. So uh, that... That, I think, is where the evidence leads. I, I don't speculate much beyond that in terms of other beings or so on and so forth. Well, what would be um, the Bush connection? <laughs> now, that's a big Pandora's box, though. Boy, yeah, I know. I know. Well, there's Nazis in the bushes. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the Bush family has connections that predate World War II, right. business connections to, to the firm of, of Fritz Thiessen. He was a major German industrialist and, and steel magnate and, and a major contributor financially to mm -hmm. the Nazi Party during Hitler's various campaigns uh, to be elected chancellor. And that relationship close relationship between Tiesen and Hitler continued for about two years after the beginning of the war, and then, then Tiesen just grew very, very disillusioned, as anyone would, mm -hmm. with, with the Nazi regime and, and, and more or less pulled his support. He did actually spend time in a concentration camp. But the American end of, of Tiesen's financing of Hitler was via Prescott Bush and his Union Banking and Trust Company in the United States, and of course Prescott Bush is, is the grandfather of our current president and then the father of, of uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st president. Yeah. Now, the, the, the financial connections are so deep that the Roosevelt administration placed Prescott Bush's union banking, uh, bank and, and trust company into holding and seized its assets under the Trading with the Enemies Act during World War II because the, the connections were so deep. Yeah. But there's another connection, and, and that's probably also pretty well known to your listeners, and that's through Skull and Bones. Both, oh, sure. both Prescott Bush, George Herbert Walker, and, and our current president were members of, of Skull and Bones, or I should say are members of Skull yeah, and Bones. Yeah, and that Skull and Bones is the Nazi death camp. Yeah, and the other thing the other thing that, that most people don't realize about Skull and Bones is that in its own official history, the Russell Trust that, that uh, owns uh, the financial uh, properties and so on of, of that society made it clear that Skull and Bones was a chapter, a lodge chapter, of a mother lodge somewhere in Germany. No one knows what. 
So in other words, the German connection goes back there, and it goes back to the 19th century. My suspicion is is that the original German mother house for skull and bones is probably some remnant or, or residue of, of uh, Adam Weishaupt's Bavarian Illuminati, because, of course, when the Bavarian government shut that outfit down, all, all that Weishaupt did and, and his followers did was they scattered themselves throughout the rest of Germany, which, of mm-hmm. course, at that time was not a, a unified country, and established what they called German reading houses. And you can document the, the connections from those reading houses to the, the uh, 1848 revolution in Europe. So it's, it's a very murky uh, connection. It's very deep. Uh, the connection with George Herbert Walker Bush is also found in, in the Kennedy assassination because at one point, if you read the historical records closely, reference is made to a G.W. Bush who is warning uh, the American government that, that something may be in play against President Kennedy. So it's a very, very murky, murky family with, a, with kind of a very shady history. It certainly is. And uh, it seems like a lot of our uh, so-called presidents <laughs> have shady histories. Oh, yes, definitely. You know, if if they didn't, of course, uh, the backers wouldn't back them for <laughs> for office. Right. You know, it's just, it's strange. Well, the rat line from Germany mm-hmm. into Mexico... Uh, through the Vatican, Argentina, Mm -hmm. Antarctica, Brazil, uh, all of that, uh, Peru. Um, These people, uh, they carried on, did they not carry on uh, more (laughs) experiments, uh, both genetically and uh, experimenting with some technologies? Well, that's an excellent question, and it's one that I, the, again, the genetic aspect I don't get into, but yeah. uh, in SS Brotherhood of the Bell, I certainly present the possibility that uh, the Bell, which was their, their most highly classified secret weapons project, a higher, much higher classification than their atom bomb, so that ought to tell you what they believed it was capable of. Right. Uh, there is some evidence that the Bell, when it went missing toward the end of World War II, along with General Kammler and, and all of its product, uh, project documentation, actually made its way to Argentina because a, a British researcher that I talk about in the book by the name of Jeffrey Brooks maintains that he uncovered confidential documents that were declassified by the Argentine government that indicated that it went there. Now, that wouldn't be anything in and of itself except for the very peculiar and very interesting fact that General Perón, when he was president of Argentina, had built for these German scientists out in the middle of (laughs) literally nowhere a, for its day, very modern plasma physics research laboratory in San Juan de, de Bariloche province, which is right over on the border with Chile, nestled in the Andes Mountains in the foothills there. Yeah. I've seen pictures of uh, the German settlements in the area, and, it's, it, you know, the houses are distinctly German. Uh, mm-hmm. There's there's nothing <laughs> Latin American about the place. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, that is a bit of corroborating evidence that the bell may have ended up in Argentina, because certainly the Nazi scientists that were working with Perón were pursuing a variety of projects more or less independently and, and simply letting Perón fund them for him or for them. So there is evidence that they continued these things. And then, of course, the other part of your question about genetic research is, of course, that, that uh, Dr. Josef Mengele ended oh, yeah. up in, in South America. And, again, it's it's hard to imagine that someone like Mengele would have just stopped thinking and started working crossword puzzles for the rest of his yeah, life. People like that, it just doesn't happen. No, no, exactly not. And, and, you know, and uh, Lord only knows what sort of butchery he committed down there. But uh, again, I just I would have a great deal of difficulty 
thinking that that all of that work and, and research stopped. And again, you know, the, the famous movie with Gregory Peck, The Boys from Brazil, is, oh, yes. is kind of based on that yeah. that premise. So we have we have in South America really a whole nest of of these uh, Nazis, and it's very interesting uh, that. One of the things I point out in, in the new book that's going to be the sequel to SS Brotherhood, which which isn't out yet. I don't know the title, so I can't give out the title to people. But but there is a book that that will hopefully be out next spring about this. And one of the things I point out is that there have never been satisfactory explanations for the deaths of three top Nazis, and they are as follows: Heinrich Miller whose nickname was Gestapo Miller because he was the actual head of, of the Gestapo. Uh, Martin Bormann, who, of course, everyone has heard of, who was uh, the Nazi Party Reichsleiter and, and Hitler's personal secretary as well, and most people don't know this. He was uh, in charge of the Nazi Party's finances as well as Hitler's personal estate finances. So he was... Uh, a financial wheeler dealer of, of a major order. And then uh, the third person is, of course, SS General Kammler, who headed up all of their secret weapons research. Now, every one of these men dies, supposedly, at the end of World War II in such dubious circumstances nice. that no one has ever really been all that certain that they did die. And in fact, I'm fairly certain that General Kammler didn't because there's no less than four different versions of his death occurring at slightly different times under wildly different circumstances in Czechoslovakia. So in other words, you know, here we have the SS simply putting out a lot of disinformation while, while the general himself hightails it out of there. Uh, Gestapo Miller and, and Bormann, of course, were the two companions that allegedly were shot to death in, in a uh, combat accident while they were trying to flee Berlin after Hitler committed suicide. But Bormann's circumstances of death are so shady that the Nuremberg trials indicted him posthumously. Yeah and tried him in absentia and sentenced him to death should he ever be found. So in other words, no one was really convinced <laughs> about yeah. Martin Bormann. <laughs> Excuse me. And by the same token about Heinrich Miller. Now if we look at what the specialty of each of these three men is, Heinrich Miller was personally in charge of the security for General Kammler's secret weapons think tank. Martin Bormann was the financial wizard, literally, of, of the Third Reich. And Kammler was the administrator or the manager that put together these huge underground complexes and, and had enough management and administrative ability to get it done and done quickly. So we have there the three necessary components for setting up any post-war independent Nazi international. We've got the man in charge of security, we've got the man in charge of financing it, and we've got the man in charge of administering its secret projects. And I find it very interesting that the Nazis in South America are so well organized after the war, they quickly penetrate into the, the Latin American drug cartels uh, and so on and so forth. So I find it very plausible that, in a, to answer your question finally, that, that the Nazis continued not only with their influence in the space programs and, and military industrial complexes of, of the United States and the Soviet Union, but that they also had a considerable off-the-books independent uh, infrastructure that allowed them to pursue their very most secret projects. In fact, I've, I've kind of revised my uh, belief that I put out in, in SS Brotherhood of the Bell. In that book, I, I came to the opinion that the Bell and its technology probably made it to this country, but I've, I've uncovered some new information that, that will be out in the new book that 
kind of indicate to me that no, it probably disappeared into Latin America somewhere. Well, there's a lot of places to hide things. Down oh there. yes, absolutely. Yeah, you can hide uh, huge things down there, and the only way um, that you could see them would be uh, if the jungle growth were uh, pared back uh, is by satellite. Right. Exactly. You know? Um, you know, they talk a lot about uh, huge underground caverns, mm -hmm. long tunnels that run for, I don't know, hundreds of miles. miles. Yeah. And that uh, some of these, uh, I think it's in, is it in Peru? Peru and, and northern Chile and, and yeah, northern Bolivia. Yeah, they've got Ecuador. one of these tunnels, Joseph, that they say the sides in this tunnel are just smooth as glass. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> how did that happen? Well, the theory the theory is, and, and that tunnel system does exist. It's, it's primarily under under Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and, and uh, Bolivia. Uh, the theory is is that those tunnels and the reason for the smoothness in some of those caves is that, is that they were lava tubes, lava flow tubes. Uh, which may or may not be true. Well, uh, I've know. been in lava flow tubes, and they're not smooth. They're, yeah, not that's, glassy smooth. That that's my problem with it as well. Mm -hmm. I think I think that uh, in many of those cases, some of those descriptions are, are clear descriptions of, of the product of a technology. Yes. Uh, and they do have uh, boring machines that have been patented in this country. Some of them have actually been built uh, that use uh, very hot uh, plasma. To, to heat and then solidify the, the rock around it as, as this boring machine moves through these tunnels, and that would create precisely that effect. So um, I think, again, given, given the descriptions of what we have heard down there and the existence of this technology in the last uh, 20, 25 years, that again we have to consider the possibility that, that these are artifacts of a technology that existed long ago. Oh, I I agree with you completely. Well, the being that uh, uh, the original uh, Nazis are for the most part all dead, mm -hmm. uh, somebody has picked up and carried the ball forward. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, and it can't be just one or two people. Right. This has to be a significant number. Right. And they have to be uh, uh, either very sequestered or blend in with society so well that no one would ever suspect. Right. I would agree. I would agree. So, you know, I... It, it, we look at also, we look at uh, uh, the Antarctic. Yes. Uh, you and I can't just go there. Right. On a vacation. Right. See, why not? Well, another, uh, another Pandora's box. Right. Um, in Antarctica, the, the Soviets uh, discovered a large underwater warm lake called Lake Vostok. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, much to their surprise, in fact, because when they took uh, ice core drillings and so on, they discovered this this huge under ice lake uh, with microbial life and everything that you'd expect, uh, methane signatures and so on and so forth that you'd expect where there's lots of plant life. Now, it has always been rumored that when the Germans sent their 1938-1939 expedition to Antarctica and spent so much time there, that they two discovered some of these areas of, of warm water springs, under ice lakes, and so on. And the Germans, being the Germans, decided to, to militarize these areas and turn them into bases for their submarines and so on. Mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is an Antarctic connection, although I think people tend to make more out of it than what may be the case. And the reason why is this. If the Germans did have bases in Antarctica, they would not have been large enough or uh, sufficiently well stocked enough for them to pursue any of their, their secret black projects, uh, secret weapons things, 
for the simple reason that the infrastructure wouldn't have been there for them to do this. If if they did have any of that technology there, it was probably technology that they simply used to defend those places. But I believe the research itself, if it was conducted independently, again, was probably conducted in Latin America in, in havens like Argentina or Brazil or Bolivia or They're or very Chile. protected when they... Uh these people, uh, the, the kind of labs that they would need, yes. uh, they're very protected. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're San Juan de Bariloche province in, Ar in Argentina, as I say, was in a very, very remote area of the country, uh, right over on the border with Chile. And again, the Germans had a very large colony of, of Nazis uh, in Chile called Colonia Dignidad. Dignidad. And the, you know, interesting about Dignidad, and I'm sure you know about this, uh, there was a man uh, in Germany that got a lot of German parents to turn over their yes. children to him, yes. and he flew them there, and uh, a lot of those children never heard from about since. Yes, yes, which would indicate the possibility, again, speculating a bit, that that the Mengele scenario of some sort of ongoing uh, medical or genetics research was, was being continued somewhere in South America by somebody. So it's a, it's a very murky, murky history, and, and again, it's uh, just to kind of tie things all up again. Um, the reason I write the books or wrote the books in the sequence that I did was precisely because I think this ancient technology and, and the Nazi ideology, which so clearly was designed in some respects to recover it, yeah. uh, I think are, are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And they're, with their recovery of this, Joseph, and their searches in um, all over the place, you know, uh, right. like you mentioned earlier, in Iraq, I mean... People have said, well, you know, they're looking for portals. No. Uh, the reason I, I, I interrupt with, with such a strong statement is, right. is there's, there's a lot of this talk mm -hmm. in alternative literature. Uh, I can think of one person in particular whose books are not referenced well at all. And it's just, it's just a, an endless game of fantasy. Yeah. Um, Agreed. The the physics of this stuff might permit something like that, and I stress might, but if so, it would be more in the form of what modern physicists would call photon entanglement, in other words, the the exchange of significant information at faster than light speeds. Mm -hmm. Now, it is interesting that in Germany, of course, once again, physicists have been successful in transmitting entire movements of Mozart symphonies at faster than light velocities. But again, this is not a portal in the sense that these people are talking about. In other words, I, I, I have to go back to, to, we have to have some basis, even if it's highly speculative, uh, we have to have some basis in science to extrapolate from in order to read these texts. We can't just invent on the basis of our wishful thinking. Right. But the other thing that I want to stress here is, and this will become very clear uh, in, in the cosmic war, there is, is almost a formula that is present in these ancient texts. And the formula is this. Mountains equal planets equal Eyes equal weapons mm -hmm. equal pyramids or ziggurats. Yes. Now, when I say equal, I don't mean to say that they're identical with. I mean it to mean more in the sense of are, are closely associated with. Because all of these ideas, once you read the text themselves, are kind of clustered together in several layers of meaning. But it is clear from those texts that these things were 
referred to as weapons. They are weapons of some sort. They are not stargates. They are not resurrection machines. They are not portals for the gods or any of this happy nonsense. All of that is a byproduct, possibly, once again, of the physics. But the intention of these things was clearly, from the texts themselves, to be weapons and to be used as weapons. Why do they need all these weapons? Well, I mean, I, you, they've got enough to kill everybody as it is. Well, I you think know? I think it's again the, my hypothesis in the cosmic war, and again, it's based on the text and on on uh, extraterrestrial archaeological evidence yeah. that the reason for it is that this was a civilization that was interplanetary in nature. It probably was based on Earth, the Moon, Mars, the missing planet, uh, a couple of moons of Saturn, and so on. Uh, in other words, it was in our local celestial neighborhood. And simply put, if you're going to rule an empire that large, nuclear bombs and rockets ain't going to do it for you. That's right. You have to have a technology of hegemony sufficient to wreaking destruction on a cosmic scale if you're going to hold this thing together. And, of course, they didn't, and, and war erupted and so on, and, and yeah. uh, great destruction was wrought. But nonetheless, you know, if we just extrapolate from, from our current situation on Earth with the various military powers of the world... Uh, that's the conclusion I have to come to. But uh, stargates and resurrection machines and so on and so forth, again, it is a possibility, and I, I stress a highly speculative one, even more so than, than my idea of ancient weapons of mass destruction. It is a possibility. But this is not entirely what the texts say. Those who wish to view them in that light and, and to think of their resurrection machines and stargates and, and cloaks of illumination and so on and so forth, are only looking at a very selected uh, uh, collection of data, and there is more to the story than just that, and the other part of the story is a weaponized technology. Well, they're certainly uh, weaponizing everything, including bugs. Yes, <laughs> you know? exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it's like a, a sickness with these people. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. It is. You know, and and I know that we touched last time on the fact about mind control mm -hmm. and uh, electronics mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the network of cell towers. And, I mean, here in Vegas, we don't have cell towers. Oh, Joseph, we have cell forests. Yeah, I've, you know, I've been to Vegas. I, I've seen it. Yeah, disguised as very funny-looking palm trees. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, you, you you talk to people, and it's, I can't, I don't know. I can't think. Right. I can't think. Right. Um, I, why can't I remember that? Or why, you know, I, I'm hearing this all the time. Well, you know, I, I don't. I don't know enough about the literature of, of electronic uh, but pollution, I mean, but yeah. it wouldn't surprise me that there is some sort of effect on, on human physiology. It's, it just stands to reason. So that does not surprise me. And in the cosmic war, again, as I, I mentioned before, I get into, uh, in that book, a consideration of those aspects of, of this physics that would seem to indicate that some involvement with consciousness was part of it. Well, then, I mean, we would say that it's intentional. Um, I don't know so much if, if cell towers and all that is intentionally designed to, to have an effect on, on the human physiology. But certainly there is particularly from the Soviet research into this stuff, mm -hmm. there is an ample body of evidence in the literature that would indicate that a certain kind of electromagnetic phenomenon can be manipulated 
to produce a desired emotional state yeah. or a desired state of health or, for that matter, disease in a, in a target population. So certainly the idea is there, but it would imply a different manifestation of the actual technology. In other words, I don't think cell towers are the correct manifestation of the technology of this stuff. I think it's something else. Yeah. Um, but it's there, certainly, in the literature. Well, and it, it does affect people's heads. Oh, well, sure, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, Vegas is uh, extremely polluted with uh, electronic or magnetic or whatever kind of waves right. you want to call them. It, it's thick. Yes. And, you know, with that kind of a fog. But um, with the um, manipulation of the fabric, do you think, Joseph, that, um, I mean, is, do we have evidence that the manipulation of the fabric of space can be carried out? Oh, yes, that's absolutely. Um, I get into this, and in fact, that's really kind of the theme of, of the sequel to SS Brotherhood of the Bell. I, I do touch on it in, in SS Brotherhood, but uh, I do so from a slightly different model of physics than I do in the, in the sequel. But basically, it boils down to uh, a physics of, of vorticular mechanics uh, in either case. But... In the new book, I, I'm, I'm trying to say things without giving out the contents of the book until it's published. Yeah. So okay. it's, it's, no, that's okay. Um, we can state with almost absolute certainty that when certain papers, well-known papers to the physics community from the 1920s and 1930s are put together with much less well-known papers in electrical engineering from the same period that the idea would have inevitably occurred to scientists on both sides of the Atlantic that some sort of electromagnetic manipulation of local space-time was indeed possible. And if we say that, then with the war clouds of World War II clearly on the horizon, then it would have been dereliction of duty for scientists on either side of, of the prospective war to not have pursued these ideas. Uh, and and. As I mentioned in SS Brotherhood of the Bell, there is a possibility that the man who eventually headed up the Bell Project uh, more or less came up with his idea as early as 1924. In other words, nine whole years before the Third Reich was even in existence. And it would have been a project that under the terms of the Versailles Treaty that the Weimar Republic could have pursued legally and certainly probably would have pursued secretly. So uh, the answer uh, to your question is a definite yes. Okay. See, I don't think people just, you know, they're going along in their life, and all of a sudden they get up out of bed one morning and they say, hey, I've got the idea about manipulating <laughs> time and space. See, these things have to come from somewhere, Joseph, and it takes a certain kind of mentality right. to conceive of it to begin with. Right. And, I mean, they're not like us, you know? Well, I think, I, I think that in terms of whether or not they're like us or not, some of these papers from this period of history that, that physicists wrote and, and published, yeah. some of them are by, by very well-known names, not even to the scientific community, but just popularly. Some of them are only known to the scientific community, but within the scientific community, they're very well-known. So if, I don't think in, in the case of these people that I'm thinking of that we have to say that they have a different mentality or spirituality. Um, they're just 
they're just doing what scientists do and, and solving certain theoretical problems in a certain way. It's when those papers are combined with the very practical papers that were being written by certain electrical engineers yeah. that we see the potential for uh, a weaponization, which would have occurred to more or less to, to government scientists. Oh, looky here, so-and-so said this, and over there, so-and-so said that. Let's put these two together and see what we come up with. That's the sort of thing I think was operating here in, in, in the case of, of the run-up to World War II. Okay, and after they put these things together, then what? <laughs> Well, if I go into the then what, I I, okay. I spill the beans on what the okay. new book is about. But um, the then what? Let's let's put it this way: we we can in, envision certain experiments yes. to manipulate things in such a way mm -hmm. as to provide camouflage, as to provide extra measures of protection, and so on and so forth. Yeah. What they were not bargaining on were nonlinear effects. Nonlinear effects are simply effects that exceed calculated prediction in, in this context. That's what they would mean. So when the scientists on both sides of the Atlantic uh, got to tinkering with these ideas and started uh, powering up their, their respective apparatus, some of the effects that they encountered were already off the charts. Mm -hmm. they, they, they could not explain them, and they were not expected. So that's what happens. Um, had, they, had they doped things out a little bit more and thought more in terms of, of the actual theoretical implications of what they were playing with, they would have uh, no doubt figured out that the possibility for some of these effects was certainly present. But I don't think in... in in, uh, at least on this side of the Atlantic, I don't think we were fully expecting what we found. Mm. Wow. Well, I would think that it can, you know, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of this tinkering around with different uh, uh, technologies does affect the human brain. Oh, sure, absolutely. In a, in massively, you know, on a mass scale. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things I point out in SS Brotherhood of the Bell is that uh, the physiological effects of, of the field of this device mm -hmm. were so dire and drastic that plant life would decay within in a matter of hours into a, a greasy goo. Mm -hmm. uh, organic uh, living animals and so on and so forth were subjected to a field that began to break down their cellular composition from within. Yeah. You know, now that that's perfectly explainable on, on conventional lines as being the effect of, of heavy neutron radiation and so on and so forth. But in some cases, the people that were exposed to this field experienced for the rest of their life persisting vertigo, uh, metallic tastes in their mouths, mm -hmm dizziness, sleeplessness, and these are not effects, typical effects of, of a radioactive field. Right. Uh, so on the basis of that, we would have to rule out that conventional explanation. So again, yes, uh, they're tinkering around with things that have enormous physiological effects. Wow. Yeah, they can uh, have everybody in the country crying one day and acting like... Uh, <laughs> ballerinas with tutus, you know, the next day. I yeah, mean, perhaps so. You know, and, and it's weird because, Joseph, I've talked to people on, and, and I mean, it stunned me. Um, and this has happened more than once, where I've talked to people on in different parts of the country, mm -hmm. different parts of the world, as mm -hmm. a matter of fact, that all have the same... Um, emotional state on that particular day. Right. And I find that bizarre. Well, I don't find that so bizarre. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it, it could be more or less coincidental. However, the thing, the thing to look for, if, if one is looking for electromagnetic signatures of this physics, would be something rather different. 
uh, several years ago on, on uh, I believe it was Art Bell, as a matter of fact, uh, there was mention of a story of several birds in Tennessee that had literally fallen out of the sky stone cold dead while they were in flight. Yes. And further digging into the story, if I recall correctly, my memory is very fuzzy here, is the people in the area where this occurred some people felt nausea, some felt a kind of a restless dizziness, and so on and so forth. Now, the reason I mentioned the bird episode mm-hmm. is because it's a clear signature of an electromagnetic pulse yes. of some sort. Yeah. And the coincidental human physiological effects would be condigned to that sort of weapon being tested or used Uh, at very low power in in that area. So that's the sort of thing I would have to look for with people from various parts of the world complaining of emotional states. I'd also be looking for other concurrent uh, goings-on or happenings in those areas, such as I've just described, or unusual levels of earthquakes occurring at at uh, synchronous times or synchronous levels within the the mantle or the crust or things of this sort. Uh, That's the sort of thing I would be looking for. Uh, I don't think mere emotional descriptions are a sufficient basis of evidence to... to, um, No, I didn't mean that it was sufficient evidence. No, I know you didn't. It's it's just fascinating. Oh, yes, it is. It is. It is, to be sure. And... uh, you know, in uh, the, in the book of Revelation, the very end of it, Joseph, it says, "And the uh, the heavens will roll up like a scroll." Mm-hmm. Well, to me, that's a scientific term of yes. some kind. Yes. It means something. <laughs> yes. It's not just uh, poetry. Yes. You know, uh, I think that uh, there is a lot of this throughout the Old and the New Testament. Well, the specific scientific conception behind what you're getting at there, if there is a scientific basis for that passage, would be torsion. 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 Mm T-O-R-S-I-O-N. It's a specific... uh, It's a specific mathematical entity in in the tensor calculus that describes a... Oh, how to... How to put it? It would describe a kind of a folding or pleating of, of the fabric of space-time. It would be, if you can imagine, uh, taking a soda pop can that you've emptied out. Dumping it. And no, it would it would be like you took the soda pop can and held one end in each of your hands and then wrung it like a dish rag. Okay. The resulting crinkles and folds in the can would be what torsion describes, as well as the fact you'll notice that when you do that, the two ends of the can draw closer together. So, uh, it, again, we're dealing with with rotation and, and with uh, with a vortex. So, it's um, there. In other words, what I'm saying is there's a specific mathematical and physical entity for what you're describing. Yeah. Well, I you know, people say, well, you know, that can't happen. That's fairy tale stuff. Well, I I see that it can happen. You know, it's a matter of of uh, people who wrote a book with a language. We use totally different terminology to this. Well, like you said, torsion. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, again, you know, if there is a physics basis for that description, then that would that would be the best contender, in my opinion. And again, yeah. it's not it's not to discount that because the whole idea behind my books is again uh, paleophysics, is the examination of ancient texts from the standpoint of what they describe and finding some modern scientific analog. And again, torsion would be. Uh, if weaponized, just a, an absolutely horrendously powerful weapon. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> they just, you know, next it'll be Rice Krispies weaponized. <laughs> I mean, what what will they not? You know, <laughs> they've got to stop somewhere. <laughs> you know, mm. it, it's just, uh, it's a lot. Wow. Yes, it is. 
Well, Joseph, you are absolutely delightful. You are uh, extremely intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my mom said. <laughs> oh, she did. Well, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm probably as old as her, and I agree with her. <laughs> <laughs> she meant it in a slightly dubious way. <laughs> oh, in a dubious way. <laughs> You know, I tell my son, I say, you know, I really love you. And he says, Mom, do you honestly mean that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, take me at my word. Um, when will your new book be out? It's out. Uh, okay. You mean the one that just came out or the one that's going to be out? The one that's going to be out. Well, the the one that's going to be the sequel to SS Brotherhood of the Bell, I imagine, will be out sometime in the spring. Um, the publisher just sent me the cover art, which means he's probably trying to put it in his uh, uh, spring-summer catalog. So I would imagine anywhere from March to June, somewhere in that uh, time frame. He hasn't indicated to me anything yet, but that's when. Uh, the book that just came out... Um, is so new that I doubt that it has hit uh, the stores yet, but it, it's probably at the distributors. Um, that's called The Cosmic War. War. And, they, you know, if your listeners do want to order that or any of the other books, they can do so directly at the publisher, which is uh, Adventures Unlimited Press. Mm -hmm. And their number is 1-800-718-4514 if they want to to do that online, it's www.adventuresunlimitedpress, that's all one word, all lowercase, dot com. The books are all sixteen ninety five each, with the exception of The Cosmic War, that's eighteen ninety five. Well, it's worth every penny. <laughs> well, I think Probably so. <laughs> twice as much, I'll tell you. You have got some words in here that I know cost 25 bucks <laughs> just to <laughs> Oh my gosh, uh, I'm pretty good with vocabulary, but you you're you are a master. Well, thank you. You really are, and this is well written. I it's uh, it is absolutely fascinating material. Yes, it, it it is. It's it's a book that I find myself reading from time to time. You know, because yeah. it is a fascinating subject. Well, you know, you write things and you build on them and in the next book and it's nice to have the the previous book to go back and make reference right, to. Right. Right. Yeah, I do you're you're quite correct. I, yeah. I did kind of intentionally lay these books out in the way that they are and and with every intention of having them dovetail at, at yeah. many detailed levels into each other and and they certainly do that. So, um Well, it makes it very very nice for the reader. Yeah. Because they can really get into this and study it. Right, exactly. I mean, this is not just any book. Right. This is this is the book. <laughs> yeah. So I would say everybody should take a look at this The Cosmic War Interplanetary Warfare, Modern Physics and Ancient Texts. Absolutely intriguing. Well, Joseph, you are delightful, and I look forward to our next edition. This is uh, a huge subject. Yes, it is. It, it's just, wow. So, for the listeners, if you want to email Joseph, you can do so at this address, Vardis, V A R D A S 3 at AOL.com. Go to his website, Giza Death Star.com. Go to the Bite Show.com and go to the library. Click on Joseph Farrell, and his special page will open up with his audio files there and the titles of the books he has written. And you can... Um, okay, give the... Do you have that 800 number? Sure. Again, that they can order the books? It's 1-800-718-4514. Okay. All righty. 
and just ask for Joseph P. Farrell's new books, the new one, The Cosmic War, uh, Interplanetary Warfare, Modern Physics, and Ancient Texts, and then we have uh, the other titles listed up there so uh, people can have that information right there. I mean, you can sit right there at your computer and look at this and call the 800 number and order the books. So, God bless everybody out there listening. You're going to need it. And uh, we'll be back. Thank you for having me on again, Georgia. Don't hang up, Joseph. All Thank right. you very much for your presentation. Oh, you're more than welcome. Perfect. Good night, everybody.